Mission and Margin is the business of healthcare. Dr. Phil Brown, thank you so much for joining the business of healthcare today. You were at the epicenter of the opioid use disorder crisis in this country. Tell me a little bit about that. One of the greatest opportunities and more so, most sobering things that ever happened to us in this community, I'd have to say. Castlight study pointed out that we were literally number one in the entire country in terms of opioid use disorder. Now, whether you want to argue with the methodology or try to be second or third instead of first is really inconsequential in terms of it clearly defined we have a problem. And it was, in fact, a crisis in our community, and it was affecting our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers. And we had to do something. What happened? How, what, what did that trigger? It triggered what I would call a desire to make a community impact. And what happened was that we convened leadership from all over our community in a two-day event where we really brought in folks to help educate us more about what the options were to affect this problem and had a chance to have some earnest dialogue in terms of what each group was doing and felt like they could offer to the problem. There are a lot of things associated with epidemics like this that we would just as soon not talk about. Either they've affected us personally or in some cases they're embarrassing or they're just taboo. And many of the issues around the opioid epidemic are exactly that. And so the relationships that we had to create had to be made more open than they would normally have been in our community because you had people who weren't commonly coming into contact with one another at such a level that you would be able to have many of the conversations that we clearly needed to have. Tell me about one of those. Tell me, tell me about one of those people and one of those taboos. Well, it's interesting, gosh, that, you know, the taboos are many, um, but certainly one of the major barriers that we had to get over was the stigma associated with opioid abuse in general. And our community, not unlike most others, in some respects view that as a personal failure. So addiction, some kind of moral failing. It's not that. And so we had to bring parts of the community who had that vision of what it really was together with other parts of the community who were more involved in the treatment and us in healthcare together to say, this is a disease process and it's a real disease in our community and we need to begin to treat it. And it involves not just the healthcare system not just the substance abuse treatment component of the healthcare system, but all of us, because we have to go farther upstream to the root of some of these problems and make better opportunities for people. Why did the, uh, the epidemic hit Wilmington so hard? What is it about Wilmington that, that made it an epicenter? Gosh, we had you know, as many opinions as there were people yeah. on why that was, but you have to realize that, you know, the, the heroin epidemic was huge here in the 1970s. And nationally, there were some changes associated with diseases that people connected mentally to needle use. So the HIV epidemic. That changed the, changed the IV drug abuse a period in, in really in our country, and Wilmington was no uh, exception to that. And crack cocaine became the drug of choice at that point in time. But over time, and we're not sure, you know, we, we definitely think there are significant connections to uh, prescribing habits for uh, prescription opioids that help usher in some of the heroin part of the epidemic because once addicted, heroin often becomes the cheapest option. And so it becomes part of a continuum. These leaders come together. Um, the community efforts were triggered. Who were those leaders? Wow, we had the leadership from our hospital system, as you know, my level and throughout the organization. We had uh, the chief of police. We had the district attorney. We had the mayor. 
we had elected officials from our local delegation to the, to the uh, state, actually, in many state senators, state representatives came. Um, you know, we had leaders from the university, leaders from the community college. We had executives from not-for-profits that are engaged in this treatment. We have other, I'll call them community not-for-profits that are help organizations for some of the underlying factors associated with the opioid epidemic. We had parents who had children who had been affected. Uh, many business leaders in the community participated in this process and it was really just a, it was a humbling thing to me to see just how broad a cross-section across our community had been cut by this problem. Who were the, some of the people involved? Well, we have a great fortune of having a local judge, Judge Jay Corpening, who has been an absolute champion for dealing with this epidemic and has brought a different thought process into his court system. Our district attorney, Ben David, has been instrumental in dealing with this problem and understanding the downstream impacts of the problems with addiction and how if we go upstream and treat those problems, then it'll have a long-term benefit. They were seeing a lot of things in the courtroom, in the criminal courtroom. Is that, is that kind of what brought them into it? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we had another thing, another event that we had uh, that was, uh, I would say, one of those crucible moments for our community is we had a car collision that resulted in, an, in the fatality of a child. An addict fell asleep at the wheel, ended up having to get reversed with naloxone. Baby died. Mother got taken to the hospital. Addict got taken to the hospital. They're both in our emergency department getting treated. And the law enforcement part of the community was devastated because this person had undergone several reversals previously. So not only did they feel a sense of sorrow at what had happened, they felt a sense of responsibility because were it not for their in the field administration of naloxone, that addict would have been dead before the accident ever happened. And that kind of story is a double-edged sword. It can be incredibly aligning or it can break apart everything. And one of the things that makes me so proud about our community, the community where I was raised, is that we used it for alignment. We used it for alignment. And it happened right about the same time as the group convened and the cast light study came out. And we've been making major positive changes ever since. The feeling that those law enforcement uh, uh, personnel were having was part of it, this question in their minds of, if we hadn't done that, then this child would still be alive. Yes. And yet, we know we had to do that. Right. Yeah. And, but it also raises the greater question of why are we doing this at all? Yeah. You know, why are we doing this at all? And the answer is because we're treating disease. We're making our community better. We're giving a chance to heal. And everybody rallied to that. <laughs> and to be a part of such a phenomenon is a pretty special thing. A pretty special thing. And it's carried us to some other, other heights you know, I think some of the capabilities that we built at that time really helped us in dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Florence as a community and rallying behind that natural disaster. Mm -hmm. It created different relationships. It created a different speed of trust between people who needed to perform at a high level at a crucial time, and it made a difference. And it'll, it'll be one of the things that when we look back on our community we're most proud of is that in that moment, of difficulty, a lot of people came up with the same right answer. 
And that's really what defines resilience. We took a bad situation and we figured out how to be better because of it, better as a community. Do we still have the problem? Yes, absolutely. Are we going to continue to impact it in great ways? Yes, we are. And we've also done all these other things in our community that make us even more special. Has the crisis touched you personally or touched your family? It has definitely uh, touched very, people that are very close to us. And I vividly remember that the coincidence behind this is almost unbelievable. But the very day that, that we convened uh, the group from the General Assembly uh, in Raleigh, as well as our local political delegation, to first address this issue, early that morning, we got a call at my house from a family friend, close family friend of my wife, whose husband was in the hospital and had an infection. He had told her that this infection in his arm was from an injury at work. He works in the construction industry here in Wilmington. Long story short, it turns out that in fact, it was not that, that it was a venous infection from IV drug abuse. Mm -hmm. And this man who was a friend of our family who just had a baby that was less than a month old at the time um, had relapsed after six years of sobriety, you know, and had found himself in a really, really bad place. And so very few of us have been spared. Um, we certainly have community leaders. We have um, members of many of the different boards in our community, Al almost everybody within one or two degrees can get to somebody who's been affected by this. This group comes together and uh, aligns, and what came of it? What were, the, what were the outcomes? What were the interventions? Well, it was fabulous. It was everybody did some things. One of the things that it is law enforcement was, was instrumental in this process, and we actually ended up with some state legislation passed that provided us with funding for what's called a LEAD program, which basically um, allows, in the event that law enforcement comes across somebody either through an on-site opioid reversal with naloxone or any other engagement, they can be put into this program, which will get them contacted again within about 24 hours to go over treatment options and be able to get treatment right at the time where they may be very likely to accept it. The individual's been through a crisis, perhaps life saved and right. your chance That's of... A, that is a perhaps a um, recoverable moment. Yeah. Similarly, um, this convening of minds spurred one of our physicians in the community to create a program for expectant mothers. Um, it's called the Tides here, and he created this for the pregnant women, and it carries it into the postpartum stage after they have the baby, and this program has child care opportunities, has, uh, you know, opportunities for the parent to get counseling, to undergo different types of therapy in addition to just the medication assisted treatment um, but just a comprehensive program because that's a very impactable moment a lot of times when an expectant mother realizes she has a problem and from our uh, medical group we were able to use our electronic medical record to change prescribing habits and put in place systems that over the 18-month period of its implementation have reduced prescription opioids in New Hanover County by 1.4 million tablets. Mm. So those are just three of the things, you know, and there were other things associated with it, take-back events. Um, our most recent take-back event, uh, which was, I think, uh, either last weekend or weekend before last, we had I want to say two and a half tons of medication returned. Not all of that is opioids, but a great offshoot of that is that people were returning medications that were still packaged. And there's a criteria that exists in terms of if we can recover these medications that, that are packaged and, 
and still thought to be safe for use or known to be safe for use, we can actually repurpose them into the free clinics in the area and we've been able to repurpose uh, over the last two take back events somewhere just south of $200,000 worth of medication that goes to people who couldn't otherwise afford it. Um, so those kind of things, those are the kind of things that spring up when you have different community conversations and you have the relationships with other people in the community who are trying to affect health. You, you find opportunities like that and that was a wonderful offshoot of it. Did you find, as, as, as this conversation ensued, did you find that there were a lot of uh, individuals pursuing uh, individual projects to try to help the help the situation. Absolutely. And, and, and was getting that alignment critical? And still is, and still is. And so one of the beautiful things that sprung out of that initial meeting was a, a group that we call the Community Partners Coalition. Okay. This was a group of many of those same leaders. Um, perhaps slightly more on the operational side of programs than on the executive side. And after several organizational meetings to go over some of the things that I talked about uh, earlier in terms of you have to get to a certain point of familiarity in order to have the right conversations. So once we got that group to that point, we broke up into several different task forces and began to address specific things, you know, like educational programs or other harm reduction things or um, infrastructural pieces to include housing, transportation, and other barriers. So that was really, I would say, one of the uh, lasting things that evolved from that first get together. The economics of treating uh, opioid addiction and most other addictions are, are challenging. Um, uh, in, in New Hanover, you, you've got a, a practice of 300 physicians or so. Um, it, how many physicians are uh, medication-assisted treatment uh, wavered, uh, able to deliver services? We have a handful, and even amongst those, they have... A, they have um, some limitations in, term, in terms of the time that they can spend doing it. One of the things that's both a blessing um, and a challenge to our community is the growth. And so on a medical provider basis, we struggle to meet basic health care needs. And not that treating this epidemic is not a basic need, but it is a need that requires additional training, which takes providers away from taking care of patients and also um, can get them into some of the same unfamiliar territory that we talk about when we talk about stigma associated with different things. There's a comfort level that we need to get to uh, in some cases to really help engage them in investing in that additional training to help solve the problem. If you were to sort of think about um, the, the one thing that could change dramatically uh, that would make it easier uh, to deliver more services other than getting more physicians. <laughs> but the one thing that you could change, what would that be? That's a tough one. Um, I honestly think it would be along the lines of getting folks comfortable with that conversation. Because the stigma that exists for an addict makes a medical provider reluctant to ask about it. If you're not willing to ask about it, there's a great likelihood that you'll never even know about it. And that's it. I mean, a big part of it is just being able to talk about it, which is why those community gatherings are so important. Because it's a different conversation entirely if you and I share a common experience, like a friend who was affected by the opioid epidemic, for instance, or like anything else, we can have a different conversation. Same thing needs to occur. We're not where we need to be yet in terms of even being able to talk about this problem as a disease, talk about it freely. The stigma being the, the, mor the moral failing, the, the, this is an individual that got themselves into a problem and, and it's not my accountability to help them out of it. It's that 
is that the stigma? That is a big part of it, yes. And we actually have a situation now in our community in terms of trying to bring a treatment facility here that is widely accepted as critical as part of solving this problem, that our entire community has a line behind, except the healthcare organization that will remain unnamed during this, who's filing suit because they don't want it in their backyard. And so it's fine to have the program as long as it doesn't affect me. And the same thing occurs in the conversation because we all gain a great comfort by having a little distance between that problem and ourselves. How much does the economics play into this? And, and what I'm thinking about is that in most cases, or not most cases, but a substantial number of cases, uh, victims of opioid use disorder are, um, because of all the things that come with it, um, perhaps don't have a job anymore and perhaps don't have a lot of assets. They don't have money to pay. They might not have insurance. Um, how much can be done or how much needs to be done to impact that? Is that a big part of the story? It's definitely a part of the story. And I think going back to an earlier question that we talked through in terms of why is Wilmington number one, one of the reasons may be that we actually have been a place that has a reputation for being able to provide help. Mm. And so in some cases, in some cases we have situations where it's easier to get more help with less resources. Those have been set up over time in the not-for-profit community. They've done a fantastic job. Um, so that exists and that may actually increase our, our problem of number of people affected because if they come and get treatment and regress, which is common, this, you know, treatment is often not a one-time deal. I mean, one thing, addiction is a lifelong disease, you know, so it sometimes, often actually, takes repeated attempts at treatment in order to get into a more stable place. And so that may also be contributing to us. But in terms of, in terms of that question of the economic uh, disparity, certainly there are parts of that, that the more resource we could put behind it, the more we can do. Yeah. Dr. Phil Brown, thank you so much for joining us today on the Business of Healthcare, and thank you for the service to your community and the work that you've done. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Watch, listen, or read Business of Healthcare interviews at bohseries.com.